Hello, and welcome back to Storytime with Eric Zimmer. Where we last left off, Stuart met a bird named Margolo, who appears in the second Stuart Little movie, and then she escaped when she learned that a friend of Snowbell the cat was going to eat her. Now this is where the real story comes in. For the book, that is. So, uh... Let's see what exactly what happens regarding this so-called adventure. So you ready? All right. Let's begin. Chapter 11, The Automobile. For three days, everybody hunted all over the house for Marglow without finding so much as a feather. I guess she had spring fever, said George. A normal bird doesn't stay indoors this kind of weather. Perhaps she has a husband somewhere and has gone to meet him, suggested Mr. Little. No, sh she has not, sobbed Stuart bitterly. That's just a lot of nonsense. How do you know, asked George. Because I asked her one time, she cried Stuart. She told me she was a single bird. Everybody questioned Snowbell cr closely. But the cat insisted that he knew nothing about Mark Glow's disappearance. I don't see why you have to make a pariah out of me just because that disagreeable little chippy flew the coop, said Snowbell irritably. Stuart was heartbroken. He had no appetite, refused food, and lost weight. Finally, he decided he would run away from home without telling anybody and go out into the world and look for Margolo. While I am about to... I might as well seek my fortune, too, he thought. Before daybreak next morning, he got out his biggest handkerchief, and in it he placed his toothbrush, his money, his soap, his comb and brush, a clean suit of underwear, and his pocket compass. I ought to take along something to remember my mother by, he thought. So he crept into his mother's bedroom where she was still asleep, climbed the lamp, cord to her bureau, and pulled a strand of Mrs. Little's hair from her comb. He rolled the hair up neatly, and laid it in the handkerchief with the other things. Then he rolled everything up into a bundle and tied it onto one end of a wooden match. With his great felt hat cocked jauntily on one side of his head, and his pack slung across his shoulders, Stuart stole... Stroll softly out of the house. Goodbye, beautiful home, he whispered. I wonder if I will ever see you again. Stuart stood uncertainly for a moment in the street in front of the house. The world was a big place in which to go looking for a lost bird. North, south, east, or west? Which way should he go? Stuart decided to s that he needed advice on such an important matter, so he started up to, down to his his friend, Dr. Paul Carey, the surgeon dentist, Owner of the sh an owner of the schooner, the Wasp. The doctor was glad to see Stuart. He took him right into his inner office where he was busy pulling a man's tooth. The man's name was Edward Clydesdale, and he had several wads of gay gauze in his cheek to hold his mouth open good and wide. The tooth was har a hard one to get out, and the doctor let Stuart sit on his instrument tray so they could talk during the operation. This is my friend Stuart Little, he said to the man with the ga gauze on his cheek. How you do, Stuart, replied the man, as best as he could. <laughs> Very well, thank you, replied Stuart. What's on your mind, Stuart? asked Dr. Carey, seizing hold of the man's tooth with a pair of pinchers and giving a strong pull. I ran away from home this morning, explained Stuart. I'm going out into the world to seek my fortune and to look for a lost bird. Which direction do you think I should start in? Dr. Carey twisted the tooth a bit and racked it back and forth. What color is the bird, he asked. Brown, said Stuart. Better go north, said Dr. Carey. Don't you think so, Mr. Clydesdale? Look in Central Park, said Clydesdale. Said Mr. Clydesdale. What? cried Stuart. I say, look in Central Park, said Mr. Clydesdale. He says, look in Central Park, explained Dr. Carey, tucking another big wad of gauze under Mr. Dr. Clydesdale's cheek. And it's a good suggestion. 
Oftentimes, people with decayed teeth have sound ideas. Central Park is a favorite place for birds in the spring. Mr. Clydesdale was nodding his head vigorously and seemed to speak to... and seemed about to speak again. If you aren't okay up there in Central Park, I got you New uh, Haven and Arthur LA and look in an etiquette. What? cried Stuart in his... At, delighted at this new kind of talk. What say, Mr. Clydesdale? If you aren't okay up there in Central Park, I go look New Haven and Arthur LA and look in an etiquette. He says if you can't locate the bird in Central Park, take a New York, New Haven, and Hartford railway train, railroad train and look in Connecticut, said Dr. Carey. Then he removed the rolls of gaze out from Mr. Clydesdale's mouth. Rinse, please, he said. Mr. Clydesdale took a glass of mouthwash, and that was beside, that was beside the chair, and rinsed his mouth out. Tell me this, Stuart, said Dr. Carey. How are you traveling? On foot? Yes, sir, said Stuart. Well, I think you'd better have a car. As soon as I get this tooth out, we'll see what can be done about it. Open, please, Mr. Clydesdale. Mr. Dr. Carey grabbed the tooth with the pinchers again, and this time he pulled so long and so hard and with such determination that the tooth popped out, which was a great relief to everybody, particularly to Mr. Clydesdale. The doctor then led Stuart into another room. From the shelf, he took a tiny automobile, about six inches long... <laughs> the most perfect miniature automobile Stuart had ever seen. It was bright yellow with a black fe with black fenders, a streamlined car of graceful design. I made this myself, Dr. Carey said. I enjoy building model cars and boats and other things when I am not extracting teeth. This car is a re has a real gasoline motor in it. It has a quite a good deal of power. Do you think you can handle it, Stuart? Certainly, replied Stuart, looking into the driver's seat and blowing the horn. But isn't it going to attract too much attention? Won't everybody stop and stare at such a small automobile? They would if they could see you, replied Dr. Carey. But nobody will be able to see you, or the car. Why not, asked Stuart. Because this automobile is a thoroughly modern car. It's not only noiseless, it's invisible. Nobody can see it. I can see it, remarked Stuart. Push that little button said the doctor, pointing to a button on the instrumental panel. Stuart pushed the button. Instantly, the car vanished from sight. Now push it again, said the doctor. How can I push it when I can't see it? asked Stuart. Feel around for it. So Stuart felt around until his hand became in contact with a button. It seemed like the Satan button, and Stuart pushed it. He heard a slight grinding noise and felt something slip out from under his hand. Hey, watch out, cried Dr. Carey. You pushed the starter button. She's off. There she goes. She's away. She's loose in the room. Now we'll never catch her. He grabbed Stuart up and raced him on the table where he couldn't, wouldn't be hit by a runaway car. Oh, mercy, mercy, Stuart cried when he realized what he'd done. It was a very awkward situation. Neither Dr. Carey nor Stuart could see the little automobile, yet it was rushing all over the room under its own power, bumping into things. First there came a crashing noise over by the fireplace. The hearth broom fell down. Dr. Carey leapt for the spot and pounced on the place where the sound had come from. But though he was quick, he had hardly got his hands on the place when there was another crash over by the wastebasket. The doctor pounced again. Pounce! Crash! Pounce! Crash! The doctor was racing all over the room, pouncing and missing. It is almost impossible to catch a speedy invisible motto automobile, even when one is a skillful dentist. Oh! Oh! Crap! Yep! Door jumping up and down. I'm sorry, Dr. Carey. I'm dreadfully sorry. Get a butterfly net, shouted the doctor. I can't, said Stuart. I'm not big enough to carry a net. That's true, said Dr. Carey. I forgot. My apologies, Stuart. The car is bound to stop sometime, said Stuart, because it will run out of gas. That's true, too, said the doctor. And so he and Stuart sat down and waited patiently until they no longer heard any crashing sounds in the room. Then the doctor got up, down on his hands and knees and started crawling cautiously all over, finding here and there until at last he found the car. It was in the fireplace, buried up to its hubs in wood ashes. The, ash. the doctor pressed the proper button, and there it stood in plain sight again, its front end fenders crumbled, its radiator leaking, and its front fender, its headlights broken, its windshield shattered, its right rear tire punctured. 
and quite a bit of yellow paint scratched off the hood. What a mess, groaned the doctor. Stuart, I hope this will be a lesson to you. Never push a button on an automobile unless you are sure of what you're doing. You're doing. Yes, sir, answered Stuart, and his eyes filled with such tears, each tear being smaller than a drop of dew. It had been an unhappy morning, and Stuart was already homesick. He was sure that he was never going to see Margolo again. Hmm. We'll just see about that. Chapter 10. I mean... Sorry. Chapter 12. The Schoolroom. While Dr. Carey was making repairs on the car, Stuart went shopping. He decided that, since he was about to take a long motor trip, he should have the proper clothes. He went to a doll shop where they had things that which were right, the right size for him, and outfitted himself completely with new luggage, shirt, suits, shirts, and accessories. He charged everything and was well pleased with his purchases. That night he slept at the doctor's apartment. The next morning, Stuart started early to avoid traffic. He thought it would be a good idea to get out on the road before there were too many cars and trucks. <laughs> Knowing how the traffic is in New York City. He drove through Central Park to 110th Street, then over to the West Side Highway, then north to the Sawmiller, Sawmill River Parkway. The car ran beautifully, and although people were inclined to stare at him, Stuart didn't mind. He was very careful not to press the button which had caused so much trouble the day before. He had made up his mind that he would never push that button again. <laughs> Good thinking. Just as the sun was coming up, Stuart saw a man seated in thought by the side of the road. Stuart steered his car alongside, stopped him, put his head out. You're worried about something, aren't you? asked Stuart. Yes, I am, said the man, who was tall and mild. Can I help you in any way? asked Stuart in a friendly voice. The man shook his head. It's an impossible situation, I guess, he replied. You see, I'm the superintendent of schools in this town. That's not an impossible situation, said Stuart. It's bad, but it's not impossible. Well, continued the man, I've always got problems that I can't solve. Today, for instance, one of my teachers is sick. Miss Gunderson, her name is. She teaches in number seven school. I've got to find a substitute for her, a teacher who will take her place. What's the matter with her? asked Stuart. I don't know exactly. The doctor says she may have rhinestones, replied the superintendent. Uh-oh. That's not good. Can you find another teacher? asked Stuart. No, that's the trouble. There's nobody in this town who knows anything. No spare teachers. No anything. School is supposed to begin in an hour. Well, I'll be glad to take over Miss Gunderson's place for a day, if you would like, suggested Stuart agreeably. The superintendent of schools looked up. Really? Certainly, said Stuart. Glad to. He opened the door of the little car and stepped out. Walking around into the rear, he opened the baggage compartment and took out his suitcase. If I'm to conduct a class in a schoolroom, I'd better take off these motoring togs and get into something more suitable, he said. Stuart climbed to the bank, went into the bushes, and was back in a few minutes wearing a pepper and salt wearing a salt and pepper jacket, old striped trousers, a Windsor tie, and spectacles. He folded his other clothes and packed them away in the suitcase. Do you think you can maintain discipline? asked the superintendent. Of course I can, replied Stuart. I'll make the work interesting and the discipline will take care of itself. Uh, don't worry about me. The man thanked him, and they shook hands. A quarter before nine, the scholars, had, another word for students, had gathered in school number seven. When they missed Miss Gunderson, a, the word got round that there would be a substitute. And the word got round, and word got round that there would be a substitute. They were delighted. A substitute, somebody whispered to somebody else. A substitute. A substitute. Huh. I had my fair share of good substitutes when I was in school. Of course... I don't remember all of them off the top of my head, but I did have some good substitutes, too. <laughs> the news traveled fast, and soon everyone in the schoolroom knew that, it were, that they were all going to have a rest from Miss Gunderson for at least a day, and were going to 
the wonderful experience of being taught by a strange teacher whom nobody had ever seen before. Stuart arrived at nine. He parked his car briskly at the, the door of the school, stalked boldly into the room, found a yardstick leaning against Miss Gunderson's desk, and climbed hand over hand to the top. There he found an inkwell, a pointer, some pens and pencils, a bottle of ink, some chalk, a bell, two hairpins, and three or four, bo three or four books in a pile. Stuart scrambled nimbly up to the top of the stack of books and jumped for the button on the bell. His weight was enough to make it ring, and Stuart pl promptly set, lid down, walked to the front of the desk, and said, Let me have your attention, please. The boys and girls crowded around the desk to, around the desk to look at the substitute. Everyone talked at once, and they seemed to be very much pleased. The girls giggled and the boys laughed, and everyone's eyes lit up with, an ex with excitement to see such a small and good-looking teacher. So appropriately dressed. Hmm. Now this was a scene that wasn't in either movie. I imagine how that would have turned out. Let me have your attention, please, repeated Stuart. As you know, Miss Gunderson is sick, and I am taking her place. Let's count the names of all the students that they mentioned. What's the matter with her? asked Roy Hart eagerly. That's one. Vitamin trouble, replied Stuart. She took vitamin D when she needed vitamin A, and she took vitamin B when she was short of vitamin C, and her system became overloaded with ribo riboflavin, thiamine hydrochloride, and even with paradoxine, the need for which in human nut nutrition has not been established. Let it be a lesson for all of us. He glared fiercely at the children, and they made no more inquiries about Miss Gunderson. Everyone will now take his or her seat, commanded Stuart. The pupils filed obediently down the aisles and dropped into their seats, and in a moment there was a silence in the classroom. Stuart cleared his throat. Seizing a coat lapel on either end to make himself look like a professor, Stuart began. Anybody absent? The scholars shook their heads. Anybody late? They shook their heads. Very well, said Stuart. The fir What's the first subject you usually take up in the morning? Arithmetic, shouted the children. That's another word for math, for those who don't know. Bother arithmetic, snapped Stuart. Let's skip it. There were wild shouts of enthusiasm at this suggestion. Everyone in the class seemed perfectly willing to skip arithmetic for one morning. What do you next study, asked Stuart. Spelling, cried the children. Well, said Stuart, a misspelled word is an abomination in the sight of everyone. I consider it a very fine thing to spell words correctly, and I strongly urge every one of you to buy a Webster's Collegiate Dictionary and consult it whenever you are in the slightest doubt. So much for spelling. What's next? The other the scholars were just as pleased to be let out of spelling as they were about arithmetic. And they shouted for joy, and everybody looked at everybody else and laughed and waved their handkerchiefs and waved handkerchiefs and rulers, and some of the boys threw spitballs at some of the girls. Hey now, that wasn't nice. Stuart had to climb onto the pile of books again and dive for the bell to restore order. What's next? he repeated. Writing, cried the scholars. Goodness as said Stuart in disgust. Don't you children know how to write yet? Certainly we do, yelled one and all. So much for that, then, said Stuart. Social studies, or history, that was always my favorite subject, comes next, replied Elizabeth Gardiner eagerly. That's two. Social studies, never heard of them, said Stuart. Instead of taking up any special subject this morning, why wouldn't it be a good idea if we just talked about something? The scholars gl glanced around at each other in expectancy. Could we talk about the way it feels to hold a snake in your hand and when it winds itself around your wrist? Asked Arthur Arthur Greenlaw. That's three. We could, but I'd rather not, replied Stuart. Could we talk about sin and vice? Pleaded Lydia Lacey. That's four. No, let's, said Stuart, let's try again. Couldn't we talk about the fat woman at the circus and she had hair all over her chin? Begged Isadore Feinberg reminiscently. That's five. No, said Stuart. I'll tell you. Let's talk about the king of the world. Leonardo DiCaprio.
<laughs> he looked all around the room, hopefully to see how the children liked the idea. There isn't any king of the world, said Harry Jameson in disgust. That's six. What's the diff? asked Stuart. There ought to be one. Kings are old-fashioned, said Harry. Not in some co European countries. Not in England. Well, all right, then. Let's talk about the chairman of the world. The world gets into a, a trouble because it has no chairman. I would like to be chairman of the world myself. You're too small, said Mary Bendix. That's seven. Oh, fish feathers, said Stuart. Size has nothing to do with it. It's temperament and ability that count. The chairman has to have the ability, and he must know what's important. How many of you know what's important? Up went all the hands. Very good, said Stuart, cocking one leg across the other and shoving his hands in the pockets of his jacket. Henry Rackmeyer, that's eight. You tell us what is important. A shaft of sunlight at the end of a dark afternoon, a note in music, and the way the back of a baby's neck mouths of its mother keeps its tidy, answered Henry. Correct, said Stuart. Those are the important things. You forgot one thing, though. Mary Bendix, what did Henry Rackmeyer forget? He forgot ice cream with chocolate sauce on it, said Mary quickly. Exactly, said Stuart. Ice cream is important. <laughs> I like this guy. Well, now, if I'm going to be chairman of the world this morning, we've got to have some rules. Otherwise, it will be too confusing, with everyone running every which way and helping themselves to things and nobody behaving. We've got to have some laws if we're going to play this game. Can anybody suggest any good laws for the world? Albert Fernstrom, that's nine, raised his hand. Don't eat mushrooms. They might be toadstools, suggested Albert. That's not a law, said Stuart. That's merely a bit of friendly advice. Very good advice, Albert, but advice and law are not the same. Law is much more solemn than, it, than advice. Law is ve extremely solemn. Anybody else think of a law for the world? Nick's on swiping anything, suggested John Poldowski solemnly. That's ten. Very good, said Stuart. Good law. Never poison anything but rats, said Anthony Brendisi. That's eleven. That's no good, said Stuart. It's unfair to rats. It has... A law has to be fair to everybody. Anthony looked sulky. But rats are unfair to us, he said. Rats are objection objectionable. He raises a good point. I know they are, said Stuart. But from a rat's point of view, poison is objectionable. A chairman has to see all sides to a problem. Have you got a rat's point of view, asked Anthony. You look l like a, a little like a rat. No, replied Stuart, I have m more the point of view of a mouse, which is very different. I see things whole. It's obvious to me that rats are underprivileged. They've never been able to get out in the open. Rats don't like the open, said Agnes Beretska. That's twelve. That's because whenever they come out, somebody sucks them. Rats might like the open if they were, they were allowed to use it. Any other ideas for laws? Agnes Beretska raised her hand. There ought to be a law against fighting. Impractical, said Stuart. Men like to fight, but you're getting warm, Agnes. Some women like to fight, too. Something they call cat fights. No, no scrapping, said Agnes timidly. Stuart shook his head. Absolutely no being mean, suggested Mildred Hoffenstein. That's 13. Very fine law, said Stuart. When I am chairman, every anybody who is mean to anybody else is going to catch it. That won't work. Rem, that won't work," remarked Herbert Prendergast. "That's fourteen. Some people are just naturally mean. Albert Fernstrom is always being mean to me. That sucks. <laughs> and they both have names that end in Bert, Albert, and Herbert. I'm not saying it'll work," said Stuart. "It's a good law, and we should give. We'll give it a try." We'll give it a try he right here and now. Somebody do something mean to someone. Harry Jameson, you be mean to Catherine Stapleford. That's 15. Wait a minute now. What's that you've got in your hand, Catherine? It's a little tiny pillow stuffed with pe 
sweet sweet balsam. Does it say, for you I pine, for you I balsam on it? Yes, said Catherine. Do you like it very much? asked Stuart. Yes, I do, said Catherine. Okay, Harry. Grab it. Take it away. Harry ran over to where Catherine sat, grabbed the little pillow from her hand, and ran back to his seat, while Catherine screamed. Now then, said Stuart in a fierce voice, hold on, my good people, while your chairman consults the book of rules. He pretended to thumb, thumb through a book. Here we are, page 492. Absolutely no being mean. Page 560. Nick's on swiping anything. Harry Jameson has broken two laws. The law against being mean and the law against swiping. Let's get Harry and send him back before he becomes so mean people will hardly recognize him anymore. Come on. Stuart ran down for the yardstick and slid it down like a fireman coming down a pole in a firehouse. He ran towards Harry, and the other children jumped up from their seats and raced up and down the aisles and crowded around Harry while Stuart...